Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Donna Newbury, and I'm the Chair of Wellbeing Australia. On behalf of the team at Wellbeing Australia, I'm thrilled to welcome you to this First Responders Wellbeing Summit. This summit has been designed by first responders in your community for you and for your loved ones and friends. For those of you who are not familiar with Wellbeing Australia, we're a government, we're a member funded um, not for profit and not funded by any government funding or any specific agency. We're simply a not for profit with a passion for empowering people to take responsibility for their own well being and to proactively find solutions to the challenges they face, often before they face them. So this summit is a result of requests from you and your loved ones over the last few years. What makes it different is that unlike other summits that might discuss policy, budgets and organizational strategies, we will focus exclusively on supporting individual well-being. As a result, we've got some great guests and commissioners um, represented here today and through the week, but have asked them less so to represent their organization and more to speak about their own personal well-being and views. In this summit, we'll be providing you with proactive and solution focused approaches to well being so that you can use these in good and difficult times. We really believe in taking a very proactive approach to well being rather than waiting until you're in a difficult situation. Secondly, we'll be sharing experiences and solutions to support your well being, both during and after active service. And lastly, promoting peer support networks that cross agencies. The themes of this summit are living well through connection, hope and community. Connection is about connecting largely with your own sense of well being to provide you with insights and awareness of the elements that make up your own well being so that you have the confidence to understand and manage that. Secondly, is hope. We're taking a very holistic approach in the summit that includes not only physical and psychological well being, but also your social and spiritual aspects of well being, which we believe are critical to the whole portfolio of well being. You'll also have access to diverse solution focused approaches, tools, resources, and strategies that hopefully will give you a sense that if you're in a bad place, things will get better and give you a bit of a roadmap to figure out how to do that. Lastly, and really importantly, is community. By sharing stories of lived experience and demonstrating how others have dealt with their well-being journey, we're hoping that you'll be inspired to identify and respond to your own unique needs. Secondly, we'd love to make sure that you feel included in a peer network and feel understood, supported and connected to the larger first responder community. Before I hand over, it's important to mention that any comments added in the Q&A section today, you'll see a Q&A section down the bottom of your screen, um, will be um, anonymous and those questions will be directed towards our panel. However, if you make comments in the chat function, they will be visible to everybody today and they won't necessarily be seen by the uh, panel. So if you have a question for any of our panel today, please do make sure that you type it in the Q&A section. Finally, I am very honored to introduce our ambassador, Shane Fitzsimmons, to share his thoughts and insights. Welcome, Shane, and thank you for your incredible support of um, First Responders Wellbeing. Shane, a question to you off the bat. Why do you think the summit's important and what are your aspirations for the attendees? Oh, thanks, Donna, and, and it's great to be with you this morning. Um, this, summit, this summit is really important. I think talking about wellbeing uh, has really come to light for me uh, over the last 12 to 18 months, uh, particularly uh, given given the extraordinary implications and the and the disaster associated with the with the bushfires that we experienced during the 1920 season. Uh, and then of course, um, all those same people have been heavily impacted like everybody else uh, with the storms and floods that then followed in February. And then we quickly moved right into COVID-19. 
and all the challenges and implications that came with with, with COVID nineteen. And and for a lot of our for a lot of our frontline workers, for a lot of our people across New South Wales, the last eighteen months, two years really epitomise the sorts of challenges for me that we find ourselves experiencing. You know, on an ongoing basis, we had people on their knees with drought, the worst drought in 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 centuries, hottest driest year two thousand and nineteen the worst bushfire season we've ever experienced. Then we saw storms and floods, and then we saw COVID. And we're all individually and collectively impacted by the, by the extraordinary events uh, of that last 18 months, and particularly the scale and the complexity and the enormity uh, of loss, uh, and indeed the tragedy uh, of losing, losing life, uh, more lives lost than we've ever experienced before, 26 lives lost, including uh, seven firefighters uh, in the firefighting effort, three air crew uh, and four, four volunteers. It changed the lives of people forever. Um, but in my, in, my, in my last 12 months, and particularly taking on the new role of Resilience New South Wales, getting out and meeting with people and talking with people uh, and being a lot more reflective, there's so much more we need to do for our own individual and collective wellbeing, particularly when it comes to sharing our thoughts and feelings. And I would I would go as far to say, I think the heaviest weight's got to be lifted by us men. Uh, there is this there is this inherent stigma attached to being resilient uh, and being strong, uh, which is somehow detached from the emotional and psychological toll that's occasioned uh, from time to time living through and dealing with very traumatic uh, events or episodes. So. The more we can personally uh, look at the person in the mirror and ask, are you okay and how you're traveling? Whilst at the same time, uh, talking to our colleagues, talking to our loved ones, talking to our families, uh, being open and honest about how we're feeling and how we're traveling, because we'll find out very quickly in my experience that we're not alone. We're not unique uh, with the thoughts and the feelings we might have, uh, and particularly the way we might be contemplating what we've experienced and where to from here. So for me, uh, this summit, the more we can open up the dialogue, the more we can talk and share, the more we will realise just how normal uh, being impacted and affected because we care, because we care about what we're doing, because we care about our customers or the community, uh, because we're part of a team, we do care. Uh, and the sorts of adversity and tragedy that we've experienced over the last 18 months, it saddens us, it hurts us. Uh, but the more we open up and, and share that, we'll realise that we're not unique and we're not alone in having those sorts of thoughts and feelings. So I encourage the summit, I encourage the conversation because the more we can converse, the more we can share with one another, the more we can help one another, the more we can help ourselves, um, realising that it's pretty normal to be impacted and affected uh, in the line of work that we find ourselves operating in. Excellent, well, thank you so much. Really appreciate your thoughts, Shane. Um, Wonderful. Well, what I might do now is introduce Carleen York. Um, many of you, I'm sure, know Carleen as the Commissioner of New South Wales SES. Carleen, welcome. We're delighted to have you with us today. I uh, would love you to just introduce yourself to our audience and give them a little bit of your background. Thanks very much, and thanks for having me on uh, the discussion as well. And I agree with Shane, this is something you know well worthwhile for people to um, tune in and be part of this very important discussion. Uh, so currently, I'm the Commissioner of the State Emergency Service in New South Wales, uh, where we have approximately 300 staff and uh, over 10,000 volunteers helping New South Wales, and our primary response is in flood storms and tsunamis. Uh, but also we help the other emergency service agencies when they're responding to their primary areas of responsibility. Um, a little bit about my background, I've had over 35 years in the New South Wales Police and uh, very much uh, uh, at, towards the end of my career in charge of human resources, concerned at the wellbeing of police officers and members of the police force and their families that are affected uh, by the work that they do. Um, I've had a career uh, in various areas and, and I know that I've seen and heard things that really we wouldn't like to see in, in the type of work that we do. I've had areas, um, times when I've had to bounce back and been affected um, by those uh, stresses that are placed on you and the responsibilities that you have. Uh, but also as I um, went up in, um, through 
the ranks uh, was allowed to or, or really able to have an influence on some of the programs that we put into the New South Wales Police and similarly doing it across here in emergency services and working with all the commissioners of police and emergency services in making sure that we can help first responders understand what their work does, um, be able to reflect on that work, uh, talk to others um, and you know, as, as much as possible be resilient, but as much as possible bounce back from the effects of, of their work. So, you know, it's a real challenge for us in this uh, position of responsibility. Um, but I think having lived some of the stresses, it really makes you understand what first responders go through. Excellent. Thanks so much, Kylene, for sharing your thoughts. Um, I guess the first question to both of you is that the theme of the conference is living well. Is that different for first responders? And what does it mean really to you for the first responder context? Uh, well, I suppose I'll go first and then Shane, Shane can add some value to that. Is, um, it is about living well and it's about the whole of the being as well. And I think that's what I really like about this summit is um, it's just uh, not about uh, physical demands or psychological demands, but it's also about um, what support you have, whether it be through family, social connections, um, sport, uh, all the other things that people that are important to people, but often get pushed aside by the demands of the type of work that they have to do, whether it's shift work, whether it's being on call and coming out at any time of the night and over the weekend and leaving some of your family to, to experience joyous occasions whilst you're not there and you're at work. So it is about um, being able to step up to do what you want to do to help your community, but also um, understanding when you have to take time out and reassess those priorities, be with your family, turn up at your sport, whatever it might be, do a, a run, um, keep your physical fitness, but also um, your mental fitness as well. And, and, and I, would, I would echo those comments of Carleen's as well, absolutely. And I think, I think the, the, the area that we often overlook in, in, our, in sharing our, our thoughts and feelings and our experiences is, is with those that matter most, the loved ones at home, the, the loved ones and friends, you know, like um, um, they genuinely have an interest in our welfare. And I think one of the things we do, uh, which we're guilty of from time to time, is not sharing with them our, our, our daily experiences, our workplace experience. So, so the more we can converse and build the, the trust there to actually lower the guard that, you know, uh, some days are more difficult than others is really important. But I, but I would also echo Carleen's comments. It's actually about uh, life balances, work-life balances. It's actually about um, having family, having friends, having social outlets, um, um, whether whether you're a person of strong faith or or spirit, spirit, spirituality, I have kind of get my word, um, um, uh, spiritual, um, uh, or indeed whether whether you are whether you are exercise or, or whatever it is, it doesn't matter. You've got to have outlets and you've got to have hobbies and you've got to have uh, the package of oneself. Um, clearly, I'm not the epitome of good exercise and good health regime. I'm working on that, but um, um, but for others, uh, it's really important, and being conscious about uh, uh, being conscious about your health and your well-being uh, is a good place to start. Having those outlets, being part of something else, giving to something else, connections with family is really, really important. Because at the end of the day, while first responders are wonderful, remarkable people doing extraordinary things every day, uh, they are just human beings at the end of it. Um, uh, and we all have thoughts, we all have feelings, we all have different needs, and we've got to be able to service and support all those as well. Absolutely, Shane. And I think um, following on to that, you know, I think specifically first responders, because you're exposed to trauma and uh, very stressful situations on a daily basis, I guess there might be certain elements and the importance of well-being might be, be different for you. Um, 
And I guess I'm just really interested to hear from both of you on, on what elements of your well-being have helped you in your career when you have felt that your well-being isn't uh, where it needs to be. So I would love to you to, to share any personal reflections or stories that you could. Do you want me to go, Carlene? Yep. So, so look, I, I, I think that's that's a really interesting question, but but for me particularly, I think um, as first responders and and, in, and and as leaders of first responder organisations, there is there is this there is this often a stereotypical um, image or or expectation on how one is supposed to operate and function, and and in so many ways, it almost it almost dehumanises a lot of this expectation to be to be so resilient and strong and seemingly unaffected by uh, by what's going on to be to be strong for everybody else. And I think until you can be until you can be true to yourself and accept the fact that vulnerability um, um, is real and is necessary, particularly in in operating and working and leading in first responder environments. I think there's more for us to do as leaders at all different levels uh, and in all different locations uh, to normalise the fact that we are people, we are humans, uh, and we do get we do get involved. And for me, I remember vividly quite a few years ago, uh, I got quite emotional at a press conference uh, in, in, a, in a massive uh, fire event that resulted in significant damage, and I really beat myself up the, the minute I finished that. That press conference and I remember all sorts of people trying to ring me and I refused to take their calls and all that sort of stuff and I found myself behaving uh, very hypocritically uh, to what I'd always asked others to do and that was that it was okay to be impacted and affected and here I was uh, doing the very opposite and doing what I was criticizing um, others for doing uh, that that it is okay to be impacted and affected because you do care about what's going on so I really I really took it upon myself from that moment uh, to be um, not just not just asking and encouraging everybody else to do what I thought was right, uh, but being very overt in my ability to say uh, this is normal and it is okay. Uh, and if you don't feel, if you don't care, uh, then the question is why 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 are you in this business? So I think for me, uh, little things like that have been turning points and being able to maintain perspective and and know that you know you might be having a bad day, but there's others having a really bad day. Uh, and well, what you're what you're experiencing is quite traumatic or quite difficult. But without your individual uh, and your team's efforts, it would be a whole lot worse for people on a daily basis. So remembering uh, that the work you're doing and the and the roles you're undertaking uh, really does make a difference in the lives of others. We might not be successful with every intervention, but boy, without them, uh, there'd be a lot more misery and and loss uh, without the effort of first responders. Yeah, and I, I look, totally agree with Shane. And um, in, in thinking about uh, this question, I, I will tell two quick stories. One is where I was particularly affected, but also where a staff member of mine was affected. So first one was when uh, I, my husband at the time was a detective and he had arrested some drug dealers and they were in Long Bay Jail and serving their sentence. So it was a successful prosecution. But they took out a contract on his life and I had a five-year-old and a two-year-old, one, one at school and one at home, and we had to move out of the house and go to a hotel in the city for some time just for his protection and that of mine and the children. And I was reflecting on this story actually just on Friday night with some friends who came for dinner, and my son was there, and he's now 32 years of age, and he remembers that. He says, oh, I remember that. And I, I was quite surprised. He was about five. And he says, oh, yes, we had this holiday in, in the city at this hotel. And, and I thought, you know, that was nice that he saw it and we protected him from that. But that, there were very little support services in, in, at that stage and, um, you know, trying to make sandwiches for kids to go to school and, and a hotel room, it was, it was quite difficult, but also the worry of what might have happened. And then I go through a number of years later when I was a commander and one of my officers actually uh, was quite... Um, uh, affected mentally in relation to the work they were doing and couldn't cope and committed suicide. And what we had to do to put, a, you know, the support around the family and, uh, you know, the guilt that you feel that you didn't pick it up beforehand, even though we knew he was quite ill and the surprise when, when this happens. And so we've come a long way when we look at how we respond um, to mental health because it, it is about how we try and 
make people resilient, how we build up their support services. And it, it came to light when we had one of our psych psychologists, you know, doing some lectures around the police force about what happens with the chem chemical stimulation in the brain when you face fear or you face excitement, et cetera. And I think that explains a lot and it, it makes people aware that it's not their um, fault, it's not their um, break, it's actually something that is happening to them that naturally occurs in your body to assist you to get through stress. Um, and, you know, they get quite stressed by the, by the re responses to the stress. And I, I really, you know, am... am uh, you know, happy or, or um, pleased that we've come so long to say, yes, we will respond when you're ill. Yes, we will put support services in, but we will also make sure that we prepare you for what your, your work as a first responder or your duties as a first responder will do and how we will try and prevent and how um, Shane spoke about, you know, men being um, aware of their feelings but actually coming forward, um, particularly for men. Um, it, is a, it is an issue, but for everyone to know that they can speak up and there isn't a penalty that will flow from that. And, you know, I don't think we're there yet, um, but we've certainly come a long way when you look at um, what has been put in place for first responders. You're so right. And both of you have spoken, touched on a, a, a subject that I think is so important, which is the stigma. Um, and regardless of of the fact that we do know it's a mental illness and that it very often is driven by situation. There's unfortunately still such a stigma associated with mental health and well-being. What do you think it's going to take to break that stigma? Oh, for me, it's it's conversations like this, and it's and it's and it's leaders leading by example, um, talk the talk, walk the walk. One of the most concerning conversations I had uh, last year was in the lead up to Christmas, reflecting on some key anniversary events from the year before. And I got chatting to a colleague and he said, Shane, I've, I've gone and got access to that um, specialist assistance you, you recommended and it's really helping. I said, that's great, mate. I'm really proud of you. And we're having a conversation. And um, I said, what, what's it done for you? He said, oh, he said, I'm... He said, I'm getting along a lot better with my wife and I can understand perspectives there. I was closing the kids out as well. Things are going better there. I'm going much better at work and I'm, you know, I'm getting along better with the volunteers, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought, this is fantastic. I said, well done, mate. Keep it going. He said, yeah, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep getting the, the support. We've got a regular catch up. I said, that's fantastic. And then right at the end of the conversation, he said, but you've got to promise me something, Shane. I said, what's that? He said, you cannot tell anybody that I'm getting help. I said, what do you mean? Um, he said, I don't want anyone to judge me. I don't want anyone to think that I'm not coping. I don't want anyone to think um, uh, that I'm still struggling with the events of the last season. And I don't want anyone to think that I'm not capable of working because I want to work. And if people think I'm, I'm getting support or assistance, then they might think that I'm not coping. And I, I, I said, look, I said, I promise you, mate, I won't say anything. I said, but it really saddens me that that's, that's your view on life and we've got to do something about it. And I hung up the phone and I kind of said, crikey, I didn't really say crikey. I thought, is this where we're at, seriously, that after the extraordinary uh, events and the tragedies of the 1920 season, that we've still got people who feel there's a stigma around getting support or getting assistance, you know? And and if if you and I, if Carlene and I go in for shoulder reconstructions, um, you know, on the same day, uh, and then Carlene's back on a tennis court six weeks later because she's fully healed, and I'm I'm not as fit as Carlene, and I'm taking I'm taking twelve weeks to get my shoulder back in order. Does anyone care? No, they don't. Uh, so so why do why do we have this stigma running around uh, that you know some people getting assistance is because they're different to others? And and what I what I learned in travelling around, uh, and I've I've shared that story at a couple of RFS events that I've been to. And what concerned me more than the original conversation was how many uh, of these officers, and particularly men, came up to me later and said, I can't remember having that conversation with you, Shane. And I thought, crockies, you know, like they, they weren't even the subject of that co telephone call, but they thought they were. So the message is really clear. Whilst we're out there asking everyone, are you OK and how you're travelling? We've also got to have the honest conversation with the person in the mirror and ask ourselves that same question. And then when we ask people how they're going, pause and listen, but hear what they're saying, and then share with them and let them know 
that you, you're, you're, you're processing the same sort of things. They're not alone. There's some really powerful messages in, I've, I've visited some of the schools and some of the, some of the, some of the um, kids' areas where they're very, kids are very honest and very open. And the, the most common messages that come through in all their narrative is, I am not alone, you are not alone, we are not alone. And, and, and there's a big message in that narrative for all of us as first responders that you can't go through traumatic events, you can't go through difficult events and not be uh, affected or impacted by them. And that's okay. But the more we bottle it up, the more we keep it closed up and think we're different or, 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 or somehow um, odd compared to everybody else, we might just find the more we talk, the more we share, the more we realise uh, that we're experiencing similar thoughts and, 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 and similar, uh, similar emotions uh, to what we've had. But amazingly, the more we normalise it and start sharing those conversations, the quicker, in my view, we heal individually and collectively because we've normalised it. The, the weight's off our shoulders because we can talk about it and it's okay to share thoughts and feelings particularly as blokes, you know. So so for me, that, that's that's really important. Fabulous. Carleen? Do you yeah, I would, look, I would agree with that. And just to add an extra couple of points, it's uh, we talk about the culture of an organisation and, you know, I know what culture I want. I, I want people to feel confident to come forward, not to feel ostracised, uh, not to be scared and put up their hand for help. But it's, I'm not the only voice in this organisation and it is the peers... Um, and it is tough for some people to talk about what they've been through, but those those people, those first responders that have been through some trauma have sought some help, have come back, um, or have have even moved out of the organisation, but been successful in their life um, in getting back on track. Um, and their voices say many many more messages than what my my voice will say. And so it's about that repetitive. Um, messaging of coming forward from many different areas across the organisation, as well as what they see in an organisation. If they see that middle managers um, will push someone aside, not welcome them back in their unit, not, not trust them with like, being able to do what they want to do to help the community, then other volunteers, other staff members will see that and won't think much of the organisation, even though it might be individual. So it's incumbent upon us as leaders to really push that message through to, as Shane says, talk the talk, walk the walk, um, but have that expectation of others as well and demonstrate it in the way in which we promote people, the way in which we get them, whether it's back on the truck or whatever duty they might be doing, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's the appearance and it's the actual um, activities of that organisation that will send that strong message that you, you can get better, you need to put your hand up, the sooner you do it, the uh, more chance of being well that you will have. That's so true. You know, I think early intervention is such a critical part of it. Um, I want to change tack a little now. We've had a question come through um, about the importance of, of proactive well-being. And as you know, with Wellbeing Australia, we're very focused on proactive manage, proactively managing your well-being rather than waiting until you reach a crisis. Um, I think the nature of the first responders' work is such that you're relying on your fight or flight instinct all the time and really getting to a point where sometimes that just doesn't want to switch off. So I guess I would love to hear your thoughts um, on how you manage to proactively manage your well-being to a point that stops you um, from going into a crisis situation. That's, that's a really hard uh, question because I've looked at uh, when I joined the police and I started um, in a class of 120 and over the years I've seen people leave because of um, physical ill health as well as mental ill health and I've often wondered why, you know, why am I excited to get up in the morning and put a uniform on and go to work whereas other people have, you know, fallen off um, to, the, to the side and not being able to do that and I think it's some of those points that we spoke about very early on is keeping those outside interests, keeping family connections, keeping sport, et cetera. And I used to talk to the probationary constables in the police down at the academy as though, you know, the day before they were at, uh, passing out at the parade, before they went to start their new job as a probationary constable and challenge them to write down all the exercise and all the outdoor activities, outside activities they were doing before they joined the, and walked into the academy 
and reflect on it 12 months later and see how has your life changed. You're now working shift work. You can't go to training for your sport on Tuesday, Thursday nights. You can't play with a team on Saturdays because you can't get there. You don't go to weddings. You're not at school functions. You don't play chess, whatever you might be doing. Um, because the adrenaline is so great when you're a first responder, you feel excited, the siren's on, you're doing a good thing, and then you go home and you get a bit, a bit down, you know, you obviously start to be at work more often because it feels better for you. So it, it's, it is a lot about that education of, of, you know, what is happening to you and your body and how do you keep um, all those things very active. And, and for me personally, it's been around family so I've had uh, two children but I was able you know at five o'clock I was working as a police prosecutor I was able at five o'clock to leave that behind when I got in the car to go and pick the children up and I was totally dedicated to them and I think that gives you a mental break from the work that you're doing and whether it's whether you have children or whether you want to go to the library or borrow books or, or whatever it's about that break from what you're doing so that you reconfigure the balance and then you can come back the, the next day or the next shift and, and do it all over again um, and, you know, rely on other people, whether for volunteers, whether it is your other employment that you go to um, and, you know, commit totally during that time to that so that you, again, can rebalance your mind and your body um, to be healthy. Shane, any specific comments or thoughts about that or...? Oh, look, I, I um, for me, picking up on Carlene's point, I, I think personally I've been pretty poor at getting um, life balance. And I, I think I think particularly being part of a volunteer organisation, it's it is it is 24 hours a day. There is you've got the you've got the business of the organisation to sort out during the week. And then all your activities are weeknights and weekends because uh, volunteers also work. So so that that life balance and being being proactive about that can be really challenging, um, but I think it is something you've really got to focus on trying to achieve. And, and in my family, um, being, being very grounded um, um, the minute you get home is really important. Um, so, so, and quality time was the big focus for us. So when, when, when I was home and, and, and with, with Lisa and the girls, it was actually about trying to have hobbies and trying to, trying to be that family unit and do other things as much as we possibly could because it, it can be difficult and particularly people that are on weird rosters and re, you know shift work and those sorts of things there's a there's a lot of disconnect from time to time a lot of social gathering so I think the other thing for me uh, is is understanding and realizing that without first responders on the front line and behind the scenes society would be a whole lot worse it would be a hot, so 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 as difficult as a day might be, or as difficult as a week might be, or or a season might be, there's something that I process in my head that without the efforts of the individual and collective team effort, imagine how bad society would actually be. So so maintaining perspective for me and and being like Carlene said, getting up every day, optimistic about going in to make a difference, make a difference in the lives of your team, make a difference in the lives of your community. There's something very empowering about that. Um, and, and if you know that there are going to be a hell of a lot more good days than there are difficult days, it, 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 it helps you with that motivation and preparing that there are going to be days that are going to be particularly difficult. There are going to be events that are going to be very troubling, um, but it's not the everyday event. There, there is so much, we, we, we gloss over how much more is achieved and the positive differences that first responders individually and collectively make every day that we shouldn't just hold on to the awful events all the time we've, we've got to keep reminding ourselves that there is a greater good here and making a difference in the lives of people is really really important such a great point um absolutely well made shane i think that um it is really about seeing that bigger picture and putting it in that context but i guess um one question that we've been asked quite a lot by first responders is that, you know, it's really at the front line that the first responders experience uh, the greatest well-being challenges and stresses. There's this perception, I think, sometimes that you as commissioners, both of you, um, far away sometimes from the, 
the face of um, some of that trauma and firefighting or um, SES work means that you don't have well-being challenges. So I would be really interested to know um, whether that's true and how your well-being has changed through your career as you've uh, moved through different roles. I'll uh, attempt to answer that very difficult question. So um, I think being commissioner, uh, we, as Shane said before, we're all human and we feel the pain of others. We see, see the stress, the strains, that we know that we are asking people to do things that will affect them um, mentally. Um, and I, I would, it, being a commissioner actually is quite a lonely life. I don't know if Shane would agree, but you know, they, you've got stresses and pressures on you that, you could never imagine before you get into that position. Um, but I think one of the, the good things is your life's experiences has probably made you ready for taking on, on that job. Otherwise, you wouldn't put your hand up to do um, such an important role. I feel privileged to do it. Um, I do get um, great comfort and warmth, I suppose, from my fellow commissioners. We are a great group of people across emergency services that can talk about the challenges of the role and the decisions we have to make and we're not alone. Um, but also, um, you know, we, we have the capacity to reach out to those support services as well if, if we want to do that. I know um, when I was in the police, I put in a program, particularly for superintendents and above, because the stress is different. If they might not be going out to uh, respond directly to the community, but they're making decisions that affect their officers or members' lives that brings different stresses and strains. So I would hope that you, you strengthen and become more resilient as you go through your career, as you're facing smaller challenges leading on to, to larger decisions that you have to make. So um, it, it prepares you to a certain extent, but it's like any, any job when you go in, there's things that you could never imagine that you face. Um, and it's, again, support of the people around you, even, um, in your own organisation and the support of family and friends, again, which is really important. Yeah, thanks. And, and I, I would I would again add and echo uh, echo a lot of what Carleen's just said there. But 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 as as a commissioner, or, or no matter what role it was coming through, there's this there's this real sense of responsibility. And I think as commissioner. Uh, I agree completely with Carleen. Uh, being a deputy uh, and being a part of that deputy structure uh, at any level, uh, there's a big team environment and you know that you do your very best, but ultimately decisions or responsibilities stop somewhere else. It's not until you become the commissioner that you realise there is nowhere else to, to move this. It's all got to be dealt with. And it does. It, it becomes a very lonely place pretty quickly. Uh, but for me... Um, um, I always, I always regarded myself, no matter what role I've had, um, no, no matter what leadership role, as a leader amongst equals. So, so never, never better or, or, or more important than anybody else. We've all just got a different role to play. Uh, I would regularly at work, uh, when it came to lunchtime, I would go downstairs and just have lunch in the lunchroom with everybody else because I'd hear about what people were talking about and what was going on. Any, no one in particular, anyone that was sitting there, I was happy to have lunch with. But there's no doubt, we, we often use this phrase, the burden of command. There is a responsibility that weighs heavily on, on commanders and leaders at all different levels. And you have this very strong sense of duty uh, to, to not wanting anything to go wrong with your team on your watch. Uh, and there is no doubt uh, when traumatic events happen in the organisation or, or, or impact the organisation, then that's deeply felt all the way to the top. And I know for me personally, during the last fire season, um, there is no doubt uh, that every impact, every loss, uh, every loss of property, every loss of life, um, uh, we felt that all the way through to the top. And most particularly, uh, the loss of firefighters uh, and volunteers, uh, the, impact, the impact that has uh, is profound. Uh, it's very deep and it's very real, um, um, uh, but as leaders, I think when things go wrong, uh, being present is so fundamental uh, and showing your team that you care uh, and that you are affected and impacted just like them because you've lost a member of the of the family effectively. Um, it really matters. So, so absolutely staying grounded and staying connected 
uh, all the way through to, you know, from, from whatever uh, leadership role you've got, a new member, all the way through to commissioner. Um, there's something quite unique about the, the first responder community, in my view, is that we are genuinely all in this together. Yeah, can I just add uh, to that as well, because I, again, agree with Shane, but it's also when there isn't the stresses and strains. So I know Shane did it when he was commissioner, I try and do it, is visit as many units and speak to as many members of our organisation and other organisations that we can in time of calm, in times of like training nights, um, because if they don't see you and they, they can't get a handle on what type of person you are because you sit in your office and you never go out, of course they will think you don't understand. But I think it's getting out, talking to them, showing that you're human, caring about them, listening to some of their concerns and bringing it back and making a change or getting someone else to change some things that they're concerned about. I think, again, that um, goes out. So it's, it's not only in that time of need, which is extremely important, but you've also already built up relationships with some of your um, members across the whole of the state to strengthen that relationship so that, that, so that you can uh, leave the organisation and, and care for them as, as you should. Excellent. Thanks so much, Kylie, for those um, insights. I agree. It's so important to build those relationships and that sense of knowing each other um, so that it can be open and honest in terms of what's best for not only the individuals, but also organizationally. Um, I guess a, a bit of a curveball for both of you. I mean, interested, we would be interested to know what gives you hope um, through various challenges that you experience. Uh, for me, uh, what gives me hope is people. Um, um, and and there's no doubt in my mind that came through so loud and clear um, in the last 18 months with the fire season and then with COVID. In the face of so much adversity, in the, in the face of so much tragedy um, and trauma, we saw the Australian spirit. We saw the... We saw the humanity shines through uh, in a very sincere, in a very genuine way. This, this overt outpouring of, of love and support, of care and compassion, of generosity, um, it gives you faith, it gives you hope. Um, um, and, and every day um, we, were, we, were, we were averaging, you know, anywhere from 2,000 to 5,000 people per shift in the field day and night. And unlike most other seasons where the intensity of a major event might go for a couple of weeks or a month, this went on for month after month after month, up to five to six months. And to see people turning up every day to do their bit to make a difference in saving and protecting as many people as possible. And we're seeing that same commitment and, and focus more broadly in community as we've gone through 2020 um, with, with COVID. Um, that gives me hope. And to see significant changes, as Carlene said, starting out 35 years ago, when we weren't having these sorts of conversations, when we weren't, when we weren't normalising the challenges of the job, where it was all about harden up and, you know, have a beer or whatever, but, but we're shifting and we've got, we've got good mindsets shifting in our older generation, but we've got some wonderful um, uh, confidence and, um, 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 energy coming through with our younger, newer recruits too uh, into the organisation and, and to see much more diversity and much more inclusion, uh, it gives me hope. So to me, um, uh, first responders, community, it's the people that really give me hope and to see the very best of that on display uh, in the last 12 to 18 months particularly, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, and just to, to add to that, I think having our members come back and to do it again, you know, like the, the stresses of it. But as Shane said before, their desire to help their own communities is so strong. That gives me hope um, that they're good people living in um, areas that need them. Um, from a personal point of view, though, is I know I started, I've only been in this job 15, 16 months. It's gone very quickly with floods, fires and um, COVID. Uh, and I had lots of emails from my members about how things should be done better, what was wrong, etc. But every now and again, I get a very nice email to say, 
oh, that change you did, which, which however small it might be, that really made a difference. Thank you, you were thinking of us. I think that really, I don't demand the thanks, so I'm not doing it for the thanks, but every now and again a member will just nicely send you an email and say, oh, I don't have to sign in at headquarters as a visitor anymore. I can sign in as a member. That was really nice that you changed that. So small things make them um, appreciate the organisation they're working in and, and when you have one, you know that there's a hundred behind it and that, and that is really fulfilling. Excellent. Well, I guess the question that many people also ask is whether resilience and well-being are the same thing. Um, obviously, Shane, I'll start with you, given that uh, the organisation you lead um, is all about resilience. Um, and I think it would be really interesting to hear your perspective on whether they are the same thing or whether resilience is, in fact, a different beast to well-being. And Donna, it's, it's, it's fair to say I've reflected more on the word resilience in the last 10 months than I ever have in my entire life. And I think, I don't think I've ever heard the word resilience get used as much in societal discussion as it has in the last 12 months, particularly with COVID on the back of the bushfires and, and storms and floods. So... The, the new agency being called Resilience, I've done, I've done some reading and I've done some listening and I've, I've had lots of conversations around the place and I do believe there's a very strong correlation between wellbeing and resilience. And, and resilience at the end of the day is how do we ready ourselves or prepare ourselves uh, for the next um, disruption, for the next tragedy, the next, the next thing that confronts us in life how do, we, how do we get ready ourselves for that? How do we deal with it? And then more importantly, how do we come out the other side better and stronger um, um, as a result of that experience? And I think it's the old Darwinian quote that says, it's not the biggest or the smartest of the species uh, that survives, but it's the one that is most able to understand its environment uh, and adjust to changing circumstances and situations in its environment. Uh, and come out of those experiences better and stronger. As I've travelled around, though, um, we, are an, we are an inherently resilient community, uh, New South Wales, Australia, and certainly in the first responders. And resilience is about being strong and it is about being balanced and it is about readying ourselves for the next event. But what I find and what I've found certainly in the last 12 months is that when we reflect on those events that help shape us and and mould us into who we are today to ready ourselves for the next event. When we look at those previous disruptors, those tragedies, those losses, whatever it is that's that we're talking about, those life experience, those lived experiences, we conveniently overlook that at the time, those experiences are invariably um, uh, bringing with it uh, some emotional trauma or tragedy. Uh, uh, and the toll is usually pretty high at the time. And you think about the events of the last 18 months, you know, losses, damage, destruction, death, uh, dislocation, uh, loss of jobs, loss of work, uh, physical separation, uh, lockdowns, isolation. You're talking about some pretty heavy um, and difficult experiences that are absolutely building resilience, that are actually making us more resilient as individuals, as communities, as organisations, but they come with a toll. And the more we can recognise uh, that there are thoughts and feelings associated with those experiences, it's part of building resilience. It's part of building, building our capacity to get ready for the next event and deal with the next event um, based on experience, but knowing we'll come out better and stronger. And the more we can talk about that and the more we can realise that, I think the better. So there is absolutely, for my liking, a very strong correlation with well-being, emotional and, and, and psychological and physical, uh, and building resilience because it's through lived life experiences that we become more resilient for the next disruption, the next event, the next the next confrontation that we might experience. Okay, so just um, adding to that, I think that's exactly right. And I think resilience is um, not talking about it from resilience New South Wales point of view, but personal resilience is a part of wellbeing. So people, you know, uh, have varying stages of resilience. What will break them? Uh, we're all different. We're all individuals. Um, it's the support that you can put around some that need more support than others. But well-being is about how what you eat, your health, your diet. It's about your exercise. It's about 
um, your break from work. It's about all the things we've spoken about today um, that that impacts resilience. But you can be quite resilient, but break down for other for other reasons in the um, dietary area or the, or the physical fitness area. So that they are all interconnected. Um, but um, you know, the health of, of a of first responder is um, broader than um, resilience, if that makes sense. So it is about all those factors can impact on your resilience as well as on your own physical and mental health. So they uh, are absolutely important. And as Shane said, we've talked, we talk about it a lot. We use the word more because we know how important it is now in relation to the strategies that we can develop to help people get through their responsibilities as a first responder. So right, Colleen, and I think what the COVID experience has really taught us in reflection is that, you know, we, we used to think about well-being as just the physical um, and or psychological aspects, but I think it's added that very strong social isolation, which for many people has become come as such a surprise to have such a big impact on their well-being. And I think that that um, is, is something that maybe not everybody realized how important that social connectedness was uh, amongst your peers and to have and how that plays into your own well-being. So just interested, I guess, the question um, of mateship, of the very strong connections that first responders have with their peers and the teamwork, the importance of in very difficult and challenging situations, having to rely on each other in life and death situations. And, you know, I guess your reflections on how that social um, is so important for, for first responders, that sense of team. Uh, look, I think it's really important. We spend a lot of time training as a team, training as cross-agency teams. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think about as commissioner, we can put all the policies and processes in place, um, but it, it, a lot of um, circumstances are unique and individual to that demand upon those first responders. But I know, I have no doubt, that those teams, whether it be from RFS, Fire and Rescue, Ambulance, Police or SES, or the other support agencies, will make it work on the ground because they work as one team. It doesn't matter what uniform they wear. Um, I think the other thing is answering a question that's slightly different is um, the social interaction and the team bonding is really important. And, and uh, I don't know, I, I would hope Shane agrees, but RFS, um, talking about his previous occupation, and SES are quite unique in that I feel that we provide people with social interaction outside their work and their family. So by coming and volunteering for us is a way that they can interact with other community members of all varying ages. And the good thing is we can find something for anyone to do no matter what age they are, from 16 through to 86. There is something to do and there is that social interaction and you make a broader team, not just those that respond to the emergency, but those that are coming into our agencies to help the community, whether it be through maintenance of the chainsaws or uh, driving the vehicles to get registered or whatever that we have them do, it, it is really about creating that mateship, working together in, again, where there's not that stress, but knowing that those go out in the field, work with other agencies. It's not only the SES team, it's the emergency responders team that works so well out there in the field. I would I would absolutely echo those comments, Carlene, and, and adding a little bit to that question as well, there's two phrases I won't use out of the last 18 months. Number one is black, black summer bushfires because it does a gross disservice to all those being impacted and affected uh, from winter through to spring and then ultimately through to summer. But the second phrase I won't use is social distancing. Um, I get it, I understand it, I know what the intent behind it is, but what we're talking about is physical distancing. Uh, it was actually about physical separation to, to help curb the, uh, the the awful spread of this of this bloody virus. So in 2020 and today, and particularly if you look at the people of New South Wales uh, through the drought, through the bushfires, the recovery, the rebuilding, and then through COVID, we needed more social cohesion. We needed more social connectedness 
than ever before. And what's been really pleasing uh, as I listen and talk to people, talk to colleagues and travel around New South Wales, is that people are openly saying that in 2020, they've never spoken as much to their family and loved ones. Yes, they're doing it via bloody Zoom, and we never heard of Zoom, you know, 12 months ago, but, but they are very conscious about connecting and talking. Um, there's been a big message coming through workforces where, where the bosses, uh, the supervisors and the CEOs are online connecting with their, with their teams more than they ever would normally in the conventional office environment and, and what have you. So, so being connected and connecting with one another, uh, I think has been really reinforced in the last 12 months. And to add to what Carleen said, um, teams connecting with each other and building those relationships of trust is really, really important because the reality is for a lot of these teams, as we've seen in the last 18 months particularly, they work together in very stressful, very difficult, very dangerous environments. They put a lot of trust in each other to be able to call out and make decisions, back each other in, back each other up. You can only build that level of trust if you've got the authentic relationship. So, so people, people want to know the real you. Uh, they want to know your strengths. They want to know your weaknesses and your limitations because together you can compensate for them. You can adjust for them. That's why I think teams coming together in volunteer organisations or in paid organisations, the more they can know each other and understand those nuances of, of strengths and limitations and how they can pull together, that's what bonds them together. And, and it's, it's that building of that trust and building confidence because they're relying on each other to get through shifts. They're relying on each other to get through that difficult situation or that support that they're rendering somebody in the field or whatever. So, so absolutely, social cohesion and connectedness is a really important part uh, of frontline uh, uh, first responders and frontline workers. And as Carleen said, it's an army of men and women that are not just the people out on the front line holding the fire hose or putting the tarp on the roof or, or walking the beat or whatever. Uh, but it's this army of men and women that are involved in logistics, in communications, in, in all those other things behind the scenes that make it possible for those people on the front line to do it as safely and as effectively as possible. So that social cohesion, knowing that they're part of a team and knowing who they are, uh, being honest with yourself, the person in the mirror about your strengths and your limitations, but also being honest with your colleagues, that's what they want to know to build that trust and build that confidence when they're working together. Excellent. Thank you both very much. Well, it looks like we're almost out of time. So um, just very quickly, um, in sort of a, about a minute or so, uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts on what is the one thing that you feel um, would assist first responders in their well-being? I'm happy to go first. <laughs> uh, for, me, for me, it's actually about giving yourself permission and giving each other permission to have open and honest conversations about thoughts and feelings, particularly uh, where there's been something distressing or difficult that's happened in the workplace or a job you've attended to. The more we can give ourselves permission, the more we can give each other permission, I'm confident uh, that the better we will heal individually and collectively uh, when we experience traumatic or difficult experiences in the workplace. I'm sorry, I'm going to break the rule and say two things. Uh, one is those, you know, the prevention, the support, the programs that we can put in place in our organisations. But, on the, but the challenge is for every individual where you see someone in distress or you think they're not quite normal, um, acting normally or behaving differently, speak up, go and see them in the, in the right manner, raise it with them and offer the help and keep offering them the help. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Shane and Colleen. It's been an absolute delight uh, to have you on and sharing your thoughts, your perspective, your experiences with us today. Um, we really do appreciate it. Um, for those of you in the audience um, who may be upset by anything that's been said today or feel that you need support, um, at the end of this, we will have a slide up which will show um, places where you can get uh, some support. We also, once you, this uh, webinar finishes, we will have a two minute survey um, that will be shared. We ask you to please complete the survey. The only reason um, we're doing it is to understand your needs. And so for future summits, we can better um, tailor the agenda to you 
and your future needs. So you can do it completely anonymously. That is absolutely fine. Um, lastly, thank you for attending and we hope you'll be online for um, other interesting sessions this week. Thanks so much. Goodbye.